20th chapter, beginning with the 19th verse. When it was the evening of that day, the first day of the week, and the doors of the house where the disciples met were locked in fear of the Jews, Jesus came and stood among them and said, Peace be with you. And after this, he showed them his hands and his side, and then the disciples rejoiced when they saw the Lord. And Jesus said to them again, Peace be with you. As the Father has sent me, so I send you. And when he had said this, he breathed on them and said to them, Receive the Holy Spirit. If you forgive the sins of any, they are forgiven. If you retain the sins of any, they are retained. But Thomas, who was called the twin, one of the twelve was not with them when Jesus came. So the other disciples told him, We have seen the Lord. But he said to them, Unless I see the mark of the nails in his hands and put my finger in the mark of the nails and my hand in his side, I will not believe. A week later, his disciples were again in the house and Thomas was with them. Although the doors were shut, Jesus came and stood among them. And he said, Peace be with you. Then he said to Thomas, Put your finger here and see my hands. Reach out your hand and put my, it in my side. Do not doubt, but believe. And Thomas answered him, My Lord and my God. Jesus said to him, You have believed because you have seen. Blessed are those who have not seen and yet have come to believe. For the word of God in Scripture, for the word of God among us, for the word of God within us. Thanks be to God. Last uh, Sunday was my first Easter at um, First Central Church. About a year ago, we moved back from Kansas City, and it was a privilege to be here beauty of the church and the flowers, the music, as always, and especially last Sunday was very glorious. Um, the spirit of the congregation, to see it so full. And then there was Scott's sermon that brought us into the garden to see the empty tomb, to see the first Appearances of the risen Lord and the excitement began to grow in the group of disciples as they realized that a miracle of tremendous proportion had taken place. One that would transform the way in which they and countless people would live because of what they had seen. But as so often happens, not everybody was there. And one of the apostles Thomas, called the twin, was absent. We're not told why, but he just wasn't there when Jesus came later in the day and appeared to them behind locked doors. Of course, when he returned, everybody was excited. They told him all about what had happened, what he had said. But Thomas said, I can't really believe that. I can't accept that. You know, I saw, the last thing I saw was him dying on the cross. But he did what we do in faith sometimes. He continued to go forward with them. And a week later, Jesus would come among them again, and Thomas would be there, and he would be able to see for himself the hands with the nail holes. He'd be able to put his hand in his side, and he called, cried out, My Lord and my God. And Jesus responds, he says, you have believed because you've seen, but blessed are those that have not seen, but will still believe. Seeing is important to believe. It is for all of us. You know, and even when we relieve, receive information from reliable sources, we often want to see for ourselves, don't we? Somebody tells you, hey, have you seen this movie? And you say, no. And they said, it's really, really good. But you're not certain. You're not going to recommend it until you go see it yourself. Or they tell you about a great new restaurant. 
hey, this is, has some of the finest food I've ever eaten. You've got to go there. If it's really important, what do you do? You go. We believe others. We trust others. But we do like to see, see for ourselves that things are the way we're told they are. Uh, before I came here, I was an interim in Kansas City at Country Club Congregational United Church of Christ there. That church had had a difficult time for the previous five years. They had lost about a third of their worshiping attendance. Um, they had experienced some real hurts. They had struggled with financially and with attendance. They had lost most of all their staff. It was a very difficult time. Well, after a month or so, I was meeting with the trustees there, and I mentioned some things that they could do to make the church feel better about itself and to be more attractive to the people that they hoped would come and join them in the future. And what I was saying to them didn't seem to make any sense. They didn't see what I had seen. So finally I said to them, okay, let's do this. Come on with me and we're going to go out the south door, which was the main entrance that was used in that church. And they got up and we all walked down the hallway, around the offices, down the hallway. They didn't see how worn the carpeting had gotten. They didn't see this huge, I mean gigantic, discoloration of the carpet where something had stained it. They didn't smell that awful smell that often pervaded the building. They didn't see that the bulletin boards were horribly out of date and unattractive. Well, we pushed out the south door and walked out onto the cracked cement walkway that led up to the church. We kicked aside, not even paying any attention to the leaves and branches that fell from the gigantic oak tree that stood there, and walked out to the curve. And I asked the trustees, I said, will you do me a favor? Close your eyes for a moment. And then I said, before you open your eyes, I want you to imagine that you are new to the community. That you're new to this neighborhood. You're driving by the church for the first time. Perhaps you've seen it from a, a main road over there. And it looks like a pretty colonial white church with a distinctive star on the top. And perhaps you're thinking to yourself, maybe some Sunday I ought to go there, see what it's about. Now I want you to open your eyes and look at the church up close, pretending you're driving by and you see the leaves piled up there and the branches blocking the way and the cracked concrete and the building in need of paint. Do you see a vibrant church ministering to the lives of its congregation involved in the community? Or do you see a church that's past its prime. Perhaps it's been sold and nobody is going there anymore. What do you see? And they stood there and they looked and they thought and they began to talk to one another. And there began to emerge some ideas. They began to see their church differently. For those changes had happened so gradually that they hadn't seen what had happened to their beautiful church. And before we got back into the meeting, they had already begun to talk about a new walkway, a sign indicating that this was the door that people were to be used. You had to guess that for yourself up to that point. They talked about new carpet, and within a year, many of those things were done. Now, that was just a small thing in the life of the church. But it began to move them to look to the future, to begin to grasp hold of new life, 
of the ministry that God was calling them to in the future. A couple of weeks ago, you heard, as I did, about the shootings down in Kansas City at the synagogue. On the TV stations, one of the people that was interviewed is the new pastor there. That church is reclaiming its life as a vital part of that community. The congregation has been growing. That Jesus calls us out to the tomb not to pay our final respects but to discover a life that goes beyond that which we often experience. Because we and a lot of the people that we come in contact with every day are struggling with life. They're struggling with any sense of hopefulness about things. They are in despair about themselves and their families and about how, what's happening in their places of work and about a lot of things that are happening in the world. And they're, and they're wondering, does anything really matter? Some of you that are familiar with the book of Ecclesiastes know that it is about a person, presumably a king that had been wealthy and powerful, Solomon, had accomplished great public works, had made a significant difference, but began to realize that nothing lasted. That he would die and that all the things that he had built. And he began... And he wrote these words, It is all in vain, all vanity, that nothing lasts. And we can begin to feel like that ourselves. We can begin to feel so very, very discouraged about. And so we need, as Pastor Scott did so well, for me, and hopefully for you last Sunday, he led us down into the garden, to the place of death, of final discouragement. And he helped us to see in the resurrection of Christ the message of hope for all of us. That death does not have the final word. That there is a power and a, something to hope for that goes beyond that which we sometimes see with our visible eyes. For sometimes we must see through the eyes of faith and trust and go forward. As I said earlier, I'm a gardener. I love to be out there, plant trees. I planted a lot of trees that I knew I would never see grow. I spend time with grandkids. I do the things sometimes and work on habitat houses, and I hope that some of you will join me down on 17th Street in the future weeks. And we'll build on that for neighborhoods that I will probably never live in. Because we are here to proclaim that there is hope. That we are to do and say the things that give other people hope in their lives. That was the ministry to which Jesus called those earliest disciples and to which Jesus calls us today. A couple of weeks ago, a friend sent me an email that he had received. It was about methane gas. Perhaps some of you have seen it. And of the dangers that are looming there with global warming. And he said, we need to share this in our churches and things. That the mainstream media is ignoring this. And I read through a, a great deal of the content of that and it made me discouraged. I thought to myself, if what they're saying here is true, there isn't much hope. Because what they were saying was that methane gas is worse than carbon dioxide in global warming. And that as we warm and that is released where it has been frozen in the Arctic tundra and in the ice and snow and cold, that it will increase this and may lead to what that person called the third mass extinction of life on planet Earth. And I, I was felt so down I didn't know how to respond to that. It was discouraging. But I did know what I could do is I could do as much as I could to continue living as green as I can. 
I could continue to do what I could do to voice my opinion. Even though I know so often our leadership doesn't seem willing to tackle the difficult and big issues of life. Because I have hope and more. As the Apostle Paul once wrote, If I have hope for only this life, I am of all people most to be pitied. That the Apostle knew that at the heart we believe in a life that is greater than that which we see. And that we believe in a God who is able to bring forth new life from what we find often discouraging and despairing. And that our mission, our task, is not only to live this life ourselves in faith, but to call others to that faith and to encourage them to live to that hope that it was discovered in the garden and was later discovered by Thomas and to others that had never seen. That is the message that we're given to have and to share. Amen.